After that, we'll hear from Alec Bogdanov, former president of the MIT Science Policy Initiative. And last but not least, we'll hear from Sam Brinton, founder of the National Science Policy Group. All of these folks have a lot of experience um, in creating and running science policy student groups, in addition to their day jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll let them introduce themselves in more detail and give you um, some more input and advice on how to run student policy groups. So each panelist will speak just briefly about their experience and their groups and then we'll open up to questions from you and the audience online. Um, and we have some questions that were submitted in advance and we'll try to get to some of those. And then you can also submit your questions live through the Adobe Connect uh, platform. So let's get started. Melanie, take it away. Thank you so much for inviting me, Kate. Like, you, like Kate said, my name is Melanie Roberts. My day job is founding director of Emerging Leaders in Science and Society, which is a service learning program for graduate students hosted by AAAS. If you want to find out more about that, you can go to elisfellows.org. But today, like Kate said, I'm going to talk all about what I did when I was a graduate student, like many of you, and founding a group called Forum on Science, Ethics, and Policy. My personal philosophy is you shouldn't have to wait until you finish your PhD to get involved in policy, and you shouldn't have to move all the way to Washington, D.C. to do it. <laughs> so um, when I was, I knew that I wanted to be in policy by my second year in graduate school, and I started looking around. I was a neuroscience student. I started looking around my university for opportunities to learn about policy and get involved, and either they weren't there or I didn't find them, um, but so we, I found some other students who were interested and we ended up starting our own group. Uh, I also started a second chapter of that group when I was a postdoctoral fellow uh, at the University of Colorado. The name of the organization, again, is Forum on Science, Ethics, and Policy, or FOSEP, and it's been over 10 years now. <laughs> and both chapters are still active to some degree. Um, and at first, you know, FOSEP was just a small informal group of friends and who were interested in policy, and we said, hey, let's do a monthly seminar series and learn about this thing called policy. We had no idea if anybody would come to our seminar series, and at our first one, it was absolutely packed, standing room only. And not only was it popular, but all these students came up to us afterward and said, hey, this is great, can I join? And we said, join what? <laughs> <laughs> and so we said, okay, we've clearly hit on something here. Maybe this isn't just about our learning. Maybe we can actually start a community of other people who care about policy. And so we went through this uh, intense strategic planning mission, uh, or strategic planning process. We clarified our vision, our mission, um, what activities we would do, how our organizational structure would be set up. And we decided that our mission would be to engage scholars, policymakers, and the public in dialogue about issues at the intersection of science and society. We talked about everything from energy policy to stem cells to dealing with uncertainty in policy making. Um, and interestingly, we didn't really think that we could affect policy. We really were just there for mutual learning. Uh, but little did we know we were actually really well positioned to make a difference. And a lot of people who know me, I'll tell you the story about how we inform stem cell uh, policy in Washington State. And we'd be happy to do that later if you're interested. But today I wanted to give some specific advice and lessons that I've learned. For those of you who are thinking of either starting your own organization or becoming leaders in one of the student organizations that exist. So I have three lessons that I have personally uh, one is you can really only learn science policy by doing it, uh, which is a lot different for most of us because we're used to taking classes. And in hindsight, I gained so much more from starting an organization that I use today than I ever would have just by taking classes. Not that classes or webinars like this aren't valuable, <laughs> but, but the skills that you need to transition into a policy career are really only learned through practice. And actually, a lot of the information that you need is only learned through talking to people, like why somebody will vote for or against a bill, what's mm -hmm. going to be on the legislative calendar next year. You really need to get out there and talk to people. Lesson number two, tap the university and your broader community resources for help with organizational development. So leading a student organization is like leading any other organization. You need to figure out how to manage people, raise money, communicate what you do in a way that others can understand. And 
Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here when I say that these aren't things that traditional graduate education teaches us to do uh, well, at least the things teach me. Uh, in fact, I hadn't even heard of strategic planning when I was a graduate student. <laughs> it wasn't until we started, we were in our visioning and strategic planning process and realized we had pretty ineffective meetings. Um, and we asked for help from a management consultant. And we had a one day strategic planning workshop and it absolutely transformed the way our group of directors worked together. So ask for help. Your students, people love to help students. Um, and we had a lot of advisors from business school outside and even outside of the university. The last lesson that I wanted to share with you is to recruit a community of the willing. Some people are not going to get or care about science policy, and that is okay. Don't waste your breath on them. Find the people who care and ask them to help you. Um, one of the things that I came to realize is that a lot of times my best contacts locally, I actually made through my national networks who cared about science policy. In fact, uh, the woman that we invited to our first uh, science policy seminar series that was overflowing, I met her at a AAAS meeting when I was in my third year of graduate school, and she's still a mentor of mine today, many, many years later. So now there's an even stronger uh, network, which our others can, can tell you about that you can tap into. So again, three lessons. Learn science policy by doing it. Tap the university and community resources to help with organizational development, and recruit a community of the willing to help. Thanks. Sure. Um, my name is Alec Bogdanoff. I am a former president of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's student group, the Science Policy Initiative. Uh, Sam Britton was also a former president of the organization. So I'll tell you a little bit about the history um, of the organization to give you the context of where we are. So in 2006, there was a group of students who led a science policy boot camp. It was basically a group of students who wanted to learn science policy. Um, at MIT, there's something called uh, Individual Activities Period, IAP as we affectionately call it, um, which is during January and students kind of take a bunch of mini classes. It's generally geared towards undergraduates, but graduate students wanted to take advantage of this time period as well. So there was a week-long course that was started. It was originally student-led. Um, eventually, it was built into a, a course that students could take credit for, uh, could actually get academic credit for that course. But that was kind of something that happened later on. At first, it was just, let's get together and talk about science policy. From that group, they realized that they needed to do things practically. So they created a congressional visit day. So a small group of students, I believe it was just like three students at the time, went down to Washington, D.C. and met with members of Congress. They actually learned, it was, it's a learn through practice model. And at the same time, back at MIT, they created a policy science policy luncheon series. So they just got together and brought people from the local Boston community to talk about science policy and the way to get involved. In 2009, we expanded the uh, kind of trips to Washington, D.C. to include an executive visit day. So there's uh, co-equal branches of government. They met with Congress, and this was their chance to meet with executive visit or executive agencies. Um, we tapped the alumni network of MIT to get a hold of people who worked in policy-related positions in the federal government. And they were more than happy to meet with students. Uh, that, again, started with a few students. And now we bring about 20 per year to a three-day event. Uh, they go all around the city and meet with almost any agency you can think of we've met with at some point. In 2012, under Sam's leadership, we created a science, technology, and policy certificate. So we actually worked with an academic department to create a certificate that graduate students could uh, obtain. Um, it was uh, an official certificate through the university, but it wasn't quite a degree. Um, but this just showed that students had taken a couple courses on science policy and also written a capstone project on a science policy topic. So we uh, started out small and slowly added more things as time went by. Um, now the Science Policy Initiative does annual speaker series where we bring in um, some fairly uh, high profile individuals to speak to the student body about science policy and what their place is in government. And so uh, 
my job as president was kind of to lead an awesome group of individuals. We focused our leadership on um, objectives. So we had three big events. Those were our congressional visit days, our executive visit days, and also our uh, science policy boot camp. And so we had an individual run each of those, and we also had an individual in charge of running our monthly meetings. So that individual found people to come and speak to us on a monthly basis. I would encourage you all to go to spi.mit.edu. That's spi.mit.edu. The website has all of the information you could possibly want on uh, the different activities that we do. And so my main goal as president was fundraising. These activities, unfortunately, are not cheap. To bring students to uh, Washington, D.C. is not a cheap endeavor. Uh, we're lucky to be in Boston, so it is a fairly inexpensive travel um, to D.C. But what we ended up being able to do was provide $200 to each of the students to uh, travel to Washington, D.C., and we paid for their hotel. And we do that now for both the executive visit days and the congressional visit days. We're very lucky with MIT that we have an administration that understands that students need experiences outside of the lab or classroom and are very supportive of this. But it does require someone every year talking to deans and department chairs and presidents and sharing with them why this is important. And so one of the things that we had to do was create materials that showed outcomes. So this wasn't just about uh, building a group, but it was also about creating materials that showed there's a direct outcome from the things we did. So uh, with that, I'll kind of talk about three things that um, may be repeated again, because they're uh, pretty common, I think, among the three of us <laughs> yeah. in terms of advice. But the first thing I would say is if you're trying to start a group, start small and targeted. You heard that. Pick one activity and do that. So maybe that's a monthly meeting where you bring someone in from the local community. And when you do that, start talking to the deans and any in your administration and say, look, we have this group of students. They are really interested in science policy. We have 50 students coming to meetings. Can we talk to you about opportunity? And then you can start building on other activities you want to do. Use your local resources. I'm not going to spend too much time because that was already said. But in your community, there's absolutely going to be people who work on science policy. You don't need to go to a national level to do this. Um, and the last thing, which Sam will touch on, is using your national network. So Sam will talk about the uh, national science policy group, but there's also something called the Science Engineering Technology Congressional Visit Days. So that's a visit day that we, our group goes as a part of, but you can go as an individual as well. Um, and a lot of times universities are willing to support a single individual going to those events. So you can go out and try to find funding for yourself. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over to you. Awesome. Uh, that was like wonderful deja vu of all of those meetings with those teams <laughs> raising that money. Uh, we were, and it was really, you're, you're right, because it was so weird, because we live in a university, we were at a university that was so supportive, and yet you were just like dreading all of these hours and hours of meetings trying to like prove to them that you were worthy. Um, it was an interesting, interesting moment. So, uh, hello. So great to see a lot of you. I'm, my name is Sam Brinton. Um, uh, I, as Will said, I was a uh, former president of SPI. And then um, SPI, the Science Policy Initiative there at MIT, had a really interesting moment in science policy history where uh, the director of the MIT DC office, someone that Kate works really closely with, um, Bill Van Billion, came and grabbed a couple of us uh, over beer at um, uh, MIT and said that there was this thing called sequestration about to happen. Um, yeah, back in the days, pre, I feel so old now, pre-sequestration. Pre uh, so, and recognize that this was really not gonna go well. Uh, and we as a few students, and Bill kind of came to the conclusion that this wasn't going to necessarily impact our professors. This was gonna impact us. As graduate students, we were the ones who were not gonna be hired. We were the ones who, we're, we're not going to have the funding, and we were the ones who were, whose careers were going to start to slowly um, you know, disappear. And it's not like you could just take a few years off and then decide, oh, I want to go back and start my research all up again for myself in nuclear uh, engineering. You couldn't just turn this experiment off and then turn it back on in a few years. It was going to either happen or not. So, uh, as good graduate students did, we wrote a letter 
thinking that maybe a few students there at MIT would sign on to this letter. Um, I was there at SPI. Again, most of my job had been more um, managerial, and so I usually serve these tasks out. So one of my friends um, of the three of us, one of us wrote the letter. One of us made a small video um, of paper animation trying to get the video across. And then my, my job was the outreach to the social media. We thought maybe 10 or 15 MIT students would sign on to our letter just saying, dear Congress, we recognize that you're going to do this, but recognize its effect on students. We as students are speaking to you directly, not to any other organization, just as us as students. Um, and 10,000 graduate students later, we realized we had something on our hands. We had a voice as graduate students that was finally coming forward and saying, it is really important that our universities represent us, and we never ever want to misrepresent that. But it is also really important that we, as Mom said, get to try this now. We don't have to wait till we're done um, with our studies to try to make an impact. We want to be part of this conversation. We delivered those letters. Um, sequestration still happened. Uh, <laughs> but, but immediately we found that this was a community of people who were really interested in figuring out how to stay involved. It was, as Melanie and I put it, we found the core. And then from that core, we kind of built out. Um, thankfully, uh, I was coming directly off of a great science policy group. I would, I would say um, OSEP and MI and SBI are pretty much in those top F, um, tier type of science policy groups. And there was a lot of students who wanted that, uh, but didn't necessarily have it at their campus. So we founded the National Science Policy Group, which I still have no idea how in the world that name had not been taken. That still makes no sense to me that like <laughs> the National Science Policy Group wasn't already stolen, but it was there. Um, and this organization, um, which I currently lead, connects all of the different science policy groups, and sometimes just the one student on a campus who really cares, um, to each other so that you can recognize that as a community, um, there's a lot of opportunity to make your voices heard um, as well as do um, a lot of learning. We're not as much of an advocacy group anymore. Um, Stand with Science technically still exists. Uh, I'm one of the only, both of our fellow, if you're watching, uh, both of my fellow members of uh, Stand with Science got married and had kids and left me alone. So um, <laughs> I'm all by myself. Uh, so we, Stand with Science still exists for advocacy work, but National Science Policy Group is our community work. Um, so I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of um, wrapping up all of this space. So one, if you're a student, um, who is interested in science policy on your campus, we probably have other students on your campus who have reached out to us and we would have to happily connect you. This is actually something that happens quite often, yeah. is that at the same university there's different opposing science policy groups because they're not recognizing that they're actually uh, there with each other or they're not, they're very um, academic focused. So the thing that I try to remind people is that you have nuclear engineers with non-nuclear engineers all sitting at the same table talking about science policy and that's great, because I'm learning a lot about science policy issues and things that I need to be able to talk about beyond my area. Um, so that, that can be really helpful. So we would happily connect you. Two, we are still developing. We had, 2016 was rough year for National Science Policy Group because as you will learn, and I think both of my co-panelists would agree, graduate students get very busy as they start to write their thesis. So there's this lovely wave in every graduate student group where you will have a double hump. You will have the first years who all start graduate school and are very, very excited to be involved, then you start writing and everyone disappears um, from the science policy group. And then in the end, oh, you want a job, so you come back into the science policy group. And this is awesome. If you are one of those people, thank you for coming back. We really appreciate <laughs> you coming back. And I apologize, maybe I'm totally misrepresenting, but like that was lately what I saw with MIT, was our membership was very much a double bell curve. Um, and this is going to happen a lot with National Science Policy Group and others as well, is that we're, we're going through that phase of students who got involved but also have to, we have other, we have a day job, um, right? We all have work that we're doing. So just know that that's something I wanted to prepare you for. You're going to have a lot of changes in membership, but that's gonna, you're going to be okay. And we'll happily get you through that. And then we'll also help by just doing regional calls um, and national calls where you can talk to 80 different, we're now at 80, we started with six two years, a year and a half ago, and we're at 80 different universities um, who all have fresh ideas. You're all trying to, there's no reason for you to try to reduplicate all of the effort. SPI has how to do a lot of these things on their website. There's no reason for you to try to figure out how to hold, host that event for the first time. Folks that did this kind of work, Elif is doing this kind of work. Right? Like, like, 
these are ways that we can use our best practices and you don't have to spend any more nights than you need to writing um, these memos. So. I wish you had existed when we had started. Right. <laughs> it would have been a lot easier. Oh, yes. Um, this, there's, there's many a time um, that I talk about this in terms of policy in general. The NSPG, as I've watched it grow, you have the, 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 the top tier, these, these groups that have existed for decade, like, like a decade, and then you have groups that have literally just started a month ago, and both of you have something to learn. That's the great part, is that if you're on um, some of the older groups, you're having probably ch challenges with retention, because how do you create something new? If you're a new group, you don't know how to host some of these, like, who do I ask in my community to come to see? So these are some of the things that NSPG can help. You can look us up at natsipaulgroup.org, um, uh, and I'm sure um, you'll send out information about that as well. So we, we are always recruiting. If you don't know if your university has a group, let us know. We're happy to help you get started. Um, and our goal for this year is 100. We hope by the end of 2017 to have 100 chapters in NSPG, there's no membership dues. We're not. We don't have a budget because we don't have anything. Um, it's just a work of connection, and we look forward to working with you. So, hopefully, that was helpful. That's great. Great. Thank you. Um, so, I want to remind all the listeners uh, that you can submit your questions in that box in the bottom of the W Connect platform. I'll start with a couple questions that were submitted in advance, and then we'll go on to some of the live questions. So, uh, let's see. Restrictions, not to start from the <laughs> pessimistic side, but what kind of hurdles did you guys have to overcome in order to get these groups going, going in the first place? Melanie, I'll start. We'll just go yeah, down. Sure. Um, but you have to answer every question, but chime in if you have something you want to. Sure. Add. What hurdles to overcome? Which one? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, a lot of people were very supportive, and we had started a career seminar series earlier when I was in my first and second year, and we figured it would be a lot like that and very similar. Some things were similar, but one thing was different was, I mean, the university's mission is to train graduate students and we should know our career options. And it was easy to get money for that. It was easy to explain. Um, the science policy group, people are like, what are you doing? You're advocating? Are you going to be talking about uh, controversial things? Maybe we shouldn't give you our money and put, <laughs> and put our name on this. So we had to be, that was one thing that we had to be much more careful. And we positioned ourselves as honest brokers. We actually didn't do advocacy for or against issues that were policy, that were science for policy issues. So we would talk about energy policy, but our group wouldn't say, and this should be your energy policy. Um, and that's how we got around that. And also we found basically some high level supporters who, who kind of vouched for us and said, you can trust that they're not going to get the university in trouble. <laughs> so those high level supporters uh, were very important. I'll say that that, that issue is fundamentally uh, most of my job uh, as president was, especially with going to Washington, D.C., a university is rightfully concerned about what a graduate student is going to represent, self, represent themselves as. So one of the things we're very clear about is we are an MIT student group, and we are very narrow issue focused, so we basically only focus on science research. Um, or I would say academic research in general, um, and the effect that that would have on graduate students. Um, and we talked a lot about our research and our backgrounds and offered ourselves as uh, resources for congressional offices. But actually getting, the, the hardest thing I dealt with was getting through uh, the university administration sometime uh, with this idea that we were representing ourselves as an official MIT as opposed to MIT students. So that is something that you'll have to sit down and have a, a very serious conversation with uh, higher ups about before kind of really building a group. Um, but it's something that I guess a lot of us wish we kind of knew going into it rather than learning kind of well, as issues of it. I mean, I learned a lot to, through that experience and I got to know the university lawyers. And actually, yeah. we worked really well together. So <laughs> I learned a lot. And, and I always have this lovely challenge because I don't understand why we're so scared of the word advocacy or lobbying, right? Like the, the concept when, when someone will use lobbyist against me as like a, a slur and I said, no, I proudly change policy. Like that's, that's something that I am proud to do as a scientist is I can influence the world with my knowledge. Um, so that doesn't make me a bad person. And I, and I agree that we're having that, that, that problem with a lot of these groups, especially if you don't have um, a really supportive university, your, your group 
can significantly slow down. Um, if you're not having um, support coming from above, they could actively work against you. And that, that, that can be really, really a big challenge. We've had, we've had universities where that happened. I think the, the largest challenge for me was, and for other groups that I've seen, has been um, proof that funding that funding doesn't need to be mass. I think we all have these ideas that budgets need to be huge, but really cheap pizza works for an yeah. event. And I think that's really hard for a lot of us because we're, we don't want to do fundraising, but you don't need to do as much. If you're doing these big group events, then you do need more funding. But I think that starting small is something that a lot of us, for at least for me, especially at SPI, at SPI as well, I felt like I needed more. I remember one of my first um, lunches, I was so proud that we had been doing a lot of funding, so I got sushi. But I could only get like this much sushi. Uh, for, so like no one got to eat at that lunch event. And I felt so terrible because like everyone's at there. The, the scientists speaking was really upset because they didn't even get really food. And so yeah, I just learned really quickly like, oh, I'm among fellow students. We all realize that we're here to try to learn. Yes, we would love some food while it's happening, but we're here to learn. Um, so that was something good I kind of wanted. I, I think that was one of the big challenges. Like managed budget expectations. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Good point. So, bringing up your point of you know pizza gets people mm -hmm. attend events. Yep. One of the questions we got online was, what kind of event do you recommend for new science policy student groups that will attract the participation of grad students? So, how do you get people in the door? In addition to pizza, which I think is totally. a solid recommendation. <laughs> you, if you are like me and you're willing to take on administration, you bring in a fiery character. You bring in someone who your as a at, at the PI or whatever, you're not saying that they're right, but you are giving them somewhere to, to discuss and to have a conversation with students. That can be really, really helpful. Uh, those characters are easy to find because they're going to be the first, when you look up something, they're probably going to be one of the first ones to come up because they're fiery. <laughs> uh, second would be um, your professors are knowledgeable and your science policy group is amongst a variety of academic groups. So I don't know the professor in biology. Like, right, like I, I've never met this person. So it may be rehashing for some students, but not for a lot of your other groups. It's the first time they'll ever even hear about it because it's in a new context. I, I would say, oh, there, you know, there's professors at every university who are on the forefront of something, mm -hmm. whether it's bioethics, uh, geoengineering, pick a very interesting topic. Generally, they tend to be the, a little more controversial. If you don't want to pick a controversial figure, pick a more mm -hmm. controversial topic and uh, bring a faculty member in to kind of discuss the academics and also maybe the broader implications of their research. We took a little bit of a different approach, I would say, because we were really trying to be the honest broker. So we, would, we had a policy where we did want to present different points of view. So either we had them together, we tried a left, right, and center debate, <laughs> discussion one time, or we would make sure we had two different events where mm -hmm. you could have different points of view um, represented. But what we found, a few things we found attractive students were especially inviting policymakers from the outside in. Professors, there are other opportunities to see professors on your campus, but there weren't that many opportunities to see like the White House science advisor or former science advisor, or to meet your congressman or something mm -hmm. like that. And it was really surprising to us that we could go and there were a lot of open doors. Um, the staff at the, our congressman's office, they met with us and we ended up having a meeting with our local congressman. Great. They definitely show up for that. Yeah. The other thing too is that you can, um, you can tack on little science policy um, briefings or socials to existing events a lot of times if you're trying to break into a new community. So. Um, to kind of piggyback on the congressman thing, uh, Look at the calendar and mm -hmm. find out when Congress isn't in session. Yep. Members of Congress tend to go to their home districts for those time periods and invite them for those weeks. Uh, you know, it might take a couple months to really get them at an event. Um, my word of caution would be make, make sure you tell your administration if you're you bringing in yeah, a yeah, official. Yeah, I was worried you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is true. Uh, that is a big, it's a very big thing. It's a federal relations officer yes. as well. So, uh, <laughs> but build a relationship with your yeah. administration and find out who the appropriate person is to discuss those things. So the next question will not surprise any of you. What do you do if you don't have an unsupportive advisor who wants you to be doing these extracurricular activities? What's your approach for that? 
I'll start, but it's, it's this, this story is always terrible because it's always an MIT person asking it and then I attack MIT. And I like always feel bad about it. And this is in no way, shape, or form against Kate or any of her companions. Um, so I actually left MIT um, in part because I was not supported for my science policy work, um, which was, I, I was happy to do, to finish my graduate degrees where they were. And I think it honestly served me really, really well, but it was an academic department that wasn't necessarily supportive. My, my, my advisor actually turned out to be very, very supportive, but a department not necessarily, um, who wanted more science than policy. And I understand that that, that can be, especially at MIT, that can be the, that can be the um, concern. I learned that I had to know how much I needed before I could go to my advisor to ask them to self defend me in that way as well. So if you're having an advisor who's not as supportive, you need to know what you need. That's, I think, a very, yes. you need to know yeah. how much policy work you want to do or where you want to go or what like it it does actually fall on you if you're not going to have a supportive advisor you can't expect that they're going to be looking out for those opportunities or those kind of things you need to know what you need that's what i would that's what i would start with and that was that was what served me well well i knew this is what i needed and so when i couldn't get it that's great we're going to have an amazing finish of this of this work and we ended on great terms and then i i got what i needed otherwise yeah, yeah i actually talked to a lot of students about this. I mentioned that I decided during my second year, by my second year of graduate school, I wanted to go into policy. I was working on stem cells at the time. And um, I remember being petrified to go in and tell my advisor <laughs> that yeah. I actually want to pursue a career in science policy. And my ask was to do some other things outside of the lab. Um, but we actually, we were pretty, so he was not, he didn't really know what science policy was. And like any parent, they kind of want you to be like them, but they also want you to be happy and successful, <laughs> and, you know, not unemployed after you graduate. So he actually said, okay, and that was about it. That was just pretty anticlimactic. And what I did was I made sure I understand what he needed me to do, to, because he had all these pressures too, publishing, et cetera. And so I made sure I understand what he needed me to do. We agreed to milestones and timelines, and I was so much more organized <laughs> after I started doing all these new extracurricular yep. things. And there was one time we had this big stem cell forum and like 700 people came and I wasn't in lab that much that week. And my, my advisor said something and I was able to just open my lab notebook and say, well, look where I am versus where we agreed. And here's my schedule of what I'm doing next. And it was okay. And then the story, one of the sort of transformative stories is because we were doing that big stem cell event with 700 people, we ended up getting invited to do a panel on stem cell policy with very famous politicians like Al Gore. Mm. We organized it yeah. as a student group. And so I invited my whole lab, and as my PI and I were walking away from talking to Al Gore, he looked at me and says, I should probably be nice to you because I have a feeling you're going to be deciding my funding soon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was the, from not knowing what science policy was to being like, okay, now I get it, and this is pretty cool. Yeah. So. And, and I think that is a story of kind of selling what the benefit of science yeah. policy is. Um, I would also, since you mentioned state government, mm -hmm. uh, there is a whole government in your, in your state, and you can also use them. So if you don't want to start with U.S. congressmen, mm -hmm. you can start with state house members, state yeah. assembly members. Um, most of them will probably be much more approachable and uh, available than uh, their counterparts in D.C. Um, so that you could start with a local state house visit day if you wanted to kind of build up from something. Um, on the advisor thing, I was very lucky. My advisor actually sat down with me. Um, I was dreading this conversation, but basically had a conversation with me. It was like, I don't think that you should go the academic route. Let's talk about things that you can do. Um, my advisor was supportive of me actually uh, being involved in SBI and um, building those relationships. Um, and again, I think it goes back to advisors want you to be successful and they want you to be happy. I became a much better grad student after I was involved in science policy than I was before because I knew what the purpose of my PhD was at that point. I learned that there are people on Capitol Hill in the federal government who have PhDs and they're valued and it's useful. Um, I think Melanie will probably have some comments on this question, but anyone can chime in. 
What have you found is the best way to get the silent members, the folks who won't speak up at some of these group activities, involved in what you want to keep it as possible and as much as So you're talking the student members of your group? Yes. Yeah. So I definitely found, I mean, we all have different leadership styles. There are introverts and extroverts. We have all these hidden talents other than our science that we're good at, whether it's marketing, writing, networking. And uh, so I found, especially to get new people involved, it's really important to have well-defined goals for people with lots of different skill sets. And they're short, they're time-bound, and it's up to the leaders, I think, to really understand what your members care about and what they're good at. So, it could be everything from member management, people who are good with databases and things, to your social media, to event coordination, to the really good networkers you have on your fundraising team. But I really think, especially at first, people don't know how to get engaged, and they're not going to necessarily know how to volunteer. So I usually recruit them specifically, and I would say to every leader of the student group, make sure you're mentoring and thinking about who's going to take your place. Um, I'll move on to the next yeah. question, which is, um, how did you connect with outside organizations if you did? What were the benefits there? How did you approach outside organizations? Well, we didn't, like, NSVG didn't exist um, uh, until I left. Uh, and we, but we did find that during um, Commercial Business Day, which is FETWG, what are the long... Science, Engineering, Technology, Commercial Business Day. Yeah, that one. Um, the long acronym, which is... This is about, uh, we are all, welcome to acronyms. Um, so <laughs> we worked with them obviously on some of that and we started seeing that there was other universities and other groups and we kind of talked to them but we didn't have a lot of um, school to school conversation. We did locally though. So we worked really significantly with the local community college called Harvard up the road. Um, <laughs> but other than that, like, that was for you. I, I won't. <laughs> wow, throw me under the bus. Okay, cool, whatever. No, um, no uh, so I, I, I see an awful disc. But no, I think that, um, that was something we did do. We did do, we, we did do regional or local university outreach um, because they had a science communication um, workshop. And we're like, oh my goodness, we would really love to come to this. Can we please come to this? And I'm like, oh wait, MIT has a science policy. And you not to learn each other. So now you should interact with the National Science Policy Group in order to connect. Um, but we, that was what we found was. And there probably are others in your, in your state. Um, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, let's see, what role can alumni take in supporting the, the student policy groups? So uh, one of the big things I started at, uh, while I was president was actually an alumni initiative. We were in our 10th year and we realized that we were going after the same alumni over and over because we knew them. Um, and what we started to do was build an alumni database to try and reach out to all of our alumni. We had, we thought about 500 people who had gone through the organization and either the congressional or the executive visit days and wanted to tap them, see where they were. Um, MIT does a very good job of tracking alumni, but we needed to kind of figure out how to track our own. Um, and so we actually created an, a position within the organization to look at alumni relations. Right. Um, and that individual is still doing that job um, in the group and trying to build a uh, listserv of, to uh, not only benefit the students, but also benefit the alumni. So connecting the alumni for job opportunities. Um, we also use the alumni when we go to Washington, D.C. We do happy hours with them. Um, go to your alumni association and uh, talk to them when you're starting a group about how to keep track of those people rather than doing it in the past. It's a lot easier to start with a list, even if you want to do it in Excel and just keep it yourselves, than trying to do it 10 years later and go back and find people. LinkedIn. LinkedIn. <laughs> well, I guess one of the reasons why Kate and I know one another is because Kate was a director of FOSEP a few years after I was. Mm -hmm. So we were second or third generation leadership. And they called on me when I was a AAAS fellow here, and I was a mentor and able to connect them with people at that time. And I still feel very, very loyal to <laughs> my alma mater and, and science policy groups everywhere, actually. And so I think alumni are thrilled to be asked by students to do things. So definitely reach out. And I will say, yeah, I, I will say as an, old, as an alum, it's, it's really awesome to, I, I got a call once or twice, you know, from a president being like, 
okay, how in the world do I deal with this? Do you know, like how, like do you, there, are, there are these moments of how do you start this conversation? And I, 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 it felt nice to be to be asked. I think that was that's some always. I, I know there's a lot of <clears throat> alumni who I'm sure or are like I'm too busy, I can't do it. But um, I try to almost always make sure that I'm there for like a baby happy hour or something like that. So it's great. So each of you touched on this briefly, but just kind of for practical advice, what is the leadership structure of, of BOSEP and SPI and MSPG? Um, and if you want to remark on pros and cons of that leadership structure for those who are thinking about forming their own groups or you know, on, uh, changing up their own groups. Sure, I can start because sure. it, it was a, I'll share what we started. I'm not sure how they are now, but what we wanted to do was to create multiple le levels of engagement so that and make sure that we had a succession plan so that we always had leaders of the group. So we had actually five co-directors, which I really like. We all took different roles, yeah. but we made decisions together. And we came to consensus on decisions. And honestly, that was one of the best teams of people I've ever worked with. And it was really an inspiration for what I'm doing now. And I really seek that kind of collaboration. Um, we, yeah. It was great. And then we all had, we all were responsible for uh, mentoring and collaborating with a committee chair. We had, and we would have co-chairs of committees that did different activities. Um, and then they would have different roles. They could decide if they wanted to have different roles in their committees. And the committee chairs that were the most engaged, we would be thinking about for the co-director roles. So that was our organization structure. So MIT requires there to be a president and treasurer of every student group. So we <laughs> had that, um, but it's still important to have, um, and at least with our organization structure, having one person kind of in charge of uh, the big picture and one person, person in charge of the money. Um, the other positions, I would call them goal-oriented leadership positions. So each of our leadership positions had a very specific goal. Organizing the congressional visit days, organizing the executive visit days, organizing the boot camp. And that was a way we could really get people into the organization. They felt, oh, I love that, and I know that I get to participate in that because I'm uh, involved uh, in uh, organizing that particular activity. So each of our leadership positions kind of had a very explicit goal. And I'm going to give kind of a don't do this moment of, uh, because I think that's also really important. Both of these are really, really good ones. I'm going to give you a, eh, this didn't work well. Uh, so NSPG obviously is grown by volunteers, and the problem is that our volunteers aren't sitting next to each other. All of our volunteers are across the country and literally never see each other, other than maybe if they come together for when we also participate in Congressional Business Day. That caused a challenge in that in 2016 when a lot of them started writing theses, we started losing people, but we didn't have a backup structure because it wasn't like they were seeing who else was working with them um, directly. That, that, that's okay, it was a good learning moment. Our leadership structure right now is myself um, and a logistics director kind of take care of the central nervous system of making sure that the parts stay um, in, in place. Then a lot of the structure goes down to regional levels. So we have an, a northeast, southeast, central, and western regions where the schools can kind of interact more locally as their issues are more local. Um, and then bring their issues up, and we have co-directors of those, which is helpful because as one gets more busy, the other one can step up and vice versa. From there, we've also decided that we needed project-oriented um, space as well. So not only do we communicate people with people, but we needed to have a director of members, someone as to go from six to 80 groups in a year and a half has been horrific. I'm going to say that as a, as a it's been horrific um, because you can't even track what, there will be times that I don't even know if there's a group at that university because it could have been so recently um, a new person. So we needed to direct a, a person whose only job was to onboard, was just to help people figure out a way to connect. And then we also do now, um, in 2017, we felt that it's going to be really, really important that we concentrate on communications. So we have a director of careers and a director of communications. The communications is going to have a job. Our goal for 2017 as, this, as a group will be to have more op-eds from students to have and to train them on how to do this, to have more communication with their state legislators and train them on how to do this. That communication styles will be run by that project, like like a CBD or like like a very specific goal um, to that person. And then careers will do the same, trying to help connect to what happens after you leave NSPG. Now, the interesting part about us is that we have a lot of 
our alumni don't ever have to technically leave. We're not necessarily only students, um, as is evident by me, um, so that we can kind of have a lot of different spaces and, and your needs will change. So I just want to point out that the thing we learned is that leadership changes. We are, our leadership structure definitely started as a group of like five of us just doing the, the, the needs and trying to communicate stuff. That didn't work because we weren't around each other, so we made it more, well, hopefully you'll see this person more often and kind of distributed the leadership, and that helped a lot with our work. So you may not obviously have that exactly in your one school, but know that leadership styles aren't set in stone. That is what I think I will, I will, I will leave you with, is that I felt like I couldn't change, and then I realized the government didn't tell me what NSBG had to look like. I could do that as well, so just know that. Alec, we have a question for you specifically. You said that outcomes are an important part to sell the program. Can you please expand on what the outcomes were that you had and the report? Have you reported sure. success? So one of the things the organization does is an annual report, and we bring that report to the administration. Uh, we talk to them about how many members of Congress we met with, how many offices we met with. So I can tell you during my tenure, we met with 50 different offices. Um, that's pretty impressive for one group to meet with that many offices. And the way we did that was because as students, you have a benefit of diversity. You have a diversity of people, a diversity of research and topics, and a diversity of locations. So we used that to our advantage, and we had people from Wyoming contact the Wyoming delegation, and Florida contact the Florida delegation. And so um, we were able to show them, basically, look at all of the people we contacted. So that's, that's the first thing. The second is using your alumni. So our alumni are all over the place. Um, we have, again, alumni all over the federal government, Capitol Hill, and this is good for the university. So showing them that by training these uh, students in science policy and encouraging them to kind of do this career path that is uh, something they want to do um, ends up benefiting the university. Um, and of course, um, with this is money outcomes. So we always said, for this amount of money, we contacted, we, we interacted with 700 students. Uh, at one point, uh, we had an event where we had 400 students. So that is a good outcome to show for the university. They sometimes think in money to student outreach dollars, um, which can be helpful uh, to think about. And this is another thing that you kind of learn with experience, what works for your university um, or college. Uh, and, and the things that worked at MIT may not necessarily work at a different university. Thank you. Another question is directed at Alec and Sam about um, the CBD, the Congressional Business Day, and the Executive Business Day. Can you tell us a little bit more about the structure of those? Sure. How long do they last? What's the, you know, do you travel there? Which the answer is yes, they're, they're both in DC. Um, and any other logistics you think are important to the community? Why don't I start and then you can do sure. all the, the better details. Um, so CBD is interesting because it, it's a really great way to, as a student, kind of apply what you've been learning. This is, this is as, as Melanie was pointing out, like. There, there is this moment where the rubber has to meet the road. Like at some point, you have to try to talk to a congressional member or a staffer or, um, you know, or even a fellow scientist and say like, oh, I didn't realize that as that's coming out of my mouth, that doesn't necessarily sound like great policy. Like, like help, let me, <laughs> let me, let me think this through. Um, and that's, that's, that's really important. Again, I, science isn't perfect. We learn, um, and so I think CBD um, has that as a main purpose of as a community coming together. And having we did it with MIT. I'm going to speak to the CBD version of um, NS of National Science Policy Group, the CBD of NSPG. That's it. Wait, uh, in DC too long. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm changing. Uh, so, the um, Congressional Business Day for National Science Policy Group is the only time that these students are generally meeting each other. So we have roughly two to three students per group kind of coming in, and then MIT kind of overwhelms, <laughs> overwhelms the, the, the scale with the amount of students, which is great. Again, we're very, very grateful to work with you all um, on those kind of things. And with that, we have found that it's roughly um, two to three days, depending, the hard part for many of our students is that they're so far away that the travel time actually eats into what they can do. We, for um, uh, National Science Policy Group, will be uh, holding ours again, as always, and the afternoon 
the morning and afternoon of the first day will be training, helping as a, as a group to come together on what are our talking points, how do you have these types of meetings, what are the what is this meeting going to look like, what are we as NSPG considering as, as a priority, and then the next day is all on the hill. So it technically could only be two days. Some will take a third day because of travel in and travel out, but know that you shouldn't need too many nights um, here for Congressional Visits Day. That is pretty simple logistics in that you have to show up as an organization, us or MIT or someone has to reserve your room so you can actually talk to each other the day before. Once you have a location, you'll, you'll discuss, you'll learn from your fellow students, you'll go through mock meetings, you'll come up with your elevator speech, you'll that night uh, make sure that you're well rested uh, or you could enjoy the wonderful things that we have here in Washington, D.C. Um, and then the next day, it's a full day. I have never met anyone who went through a congressional visit day who was like, oh, the day on the hill was like the easiest thing ever. It's, it's a full day of getting as many of these meetings in as possible. You'll generally be meeting with a staffer, um, sometimes in a hallway, sometimes in a, what looks like a closet, um, sometimes in a nice room like this. Uh, and you'll be discussing with them who you are, why you're there, and what um, you're hoping that their boss and your congressional member um, can, can kind of work with you on. I have found the most important part of CVD is actually directly following it. So what I learned from CVD and others was that I was supposed to become a resource to that congressional member. I want to be, when they think of, uh, of nuclear issues, oh, Sam, Sam does that. I remember meeting with someone who did that. They came for CBD, and they'll 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 connect you. That's what we and others um, and executive at the state as well kind of want you to become. We want you to become. Not only do you get the benefit of of seeing how this experience works, but you'll get give them the benefit of a resource to refer to. That's what I would say. That's great. Um, I will tell you that uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna rank. There are a lot of work. As someone who has both has planned both a congressional and an executive visit days, and overseen uh, other people planning them, uh, they take a lot of hours to get logistics together. Um, some of the quick things I'll say is that, that people don't necessarily think about are pre meetings. Uh, make sure you meet with people beforehand. And talk about things like you should wear a suit. Believe it or not, these are not necessarily yes. things people think about. Um, you'll have to coordinate hotels and travel and. Uh, worry about the events there and setting up the meetings on Capitol Hill. Um, you should definitely reach out to resources about how to do that. That is something that there is a, a good way and a not so good way to do that. Um, you need to actually organize all the meetings and figure out the schedules. Um, and then you need to do follow up. So we always do media. We work with uh, MIT to put out a press release about this. We write reports um, about who we met with and what, what we talked about. Um, and XVD is a little bit of a different animal because generally it's one person who's reaching out to as many people as they can in different agencies and trying to get that together. I think that's, if, if you were trying to pick one or the other to start as a group, I'd say go with CVD. There's a very clear organizational structure you can be a part of through set CVD. XVD is kind of something that we've built uh, through the MIT DC office. We're very lucky that MIT has a strong presence in Washington DC. Other universities do as well, and if yours does, use use them, take advantage of that, talk to them, and um, that is something that I would shoot for kind of as an organization grows and not necessarily kind of one of your first trips to DC. And I would just add, we didn't organize, organize congressional visits ourselves as the student group, but I participated in other congressional visits that were organized by a number of other groups. Um, and so I went by myself to do those. It was really interesting um, to be on both sides of it. So as a graduate student, I would go and I would share what I was doing and I would offer myself as a resource for stem cell policy. And then when I was a AAAS policy fellow working in Congress, I would meet with the students who were right. coming to DC. And a lot of them were actually really useful, especially when they brought me things that I could use to show the real impact of science funding in our state uh, or information about an issue that was on our agenda right then, I could really use it to shape the things that I was working on. So I really appreciate when, especially the AAAS fellows, I now appreciate when the students come to visit. And other things that you can do outside of meeting Congress or uh, the federal agencies in DC is the AAAS annual meeting every year is a great yeah. resource. There are a 
lot of people doing science policy at that meeting. So you can network with a lot of folks, and a lot of the a lot of the topics of the meeting are very relevant to learning about science policy. So folks have always sent students emailers to my list, and we meet every year in the winter time. So that's another resource. And this year's theme is science policy for society, I think, in Boston, and MIT will be highly engaged in that. AAAS is and MIT are partnering on, I think, a science policy shindig, mm -hmm. and I think we can share some more information about that on, on ESEP. Um, so, uh, yeah. Maybe we'll see you in February at the last meeting. That's and, right. and other professional societies have That's right, yeah. congressional visit yep. days. Uh, I, for, I'm a meteorologist and oceanographer, and I, so I know that the American Meteorological yes. Society does a, both a policy uh, summer program and also a congressional visit days. And you can go through those programs, and some of them provide funding as well to students. So look up your professional society, whether you're a psychologist or a biologist, um, and see if they have a visit day, and if not, uh, Talk to them about maybe creating them. Absolutely. So one of the questions that came in um, were what resources are available online to help new student science policy groups get going. So of course you should check out Engaging Scientists and Scientists and Engineers in Policy or ESEP, which is science-engage.org. That's where you'll find webinars such as this and a lot of resources, including a list of all kinds of fellowships that you can get involved in um, to learn about science policy. AAAS has a lot of resources, so go to AAAS.org slash programs, and they have a bunch of stuff that you can find there as well. Do you guys have other resources that you want to make sure people can find online? I mean, so we don't put it out online partially because we're worried um, that you need a conversation first about it, but we actually have a, like, here's your first, here's your first um, 10 days of the science policy group. Like, here's your first event, oh, here's your, like, we've developed that very, and we only send it out very, to groups that are have communicate with us, partially because we don't want this to just be something that you you think you're alone and off on your own yeah, doing right. it. Like we want to be there to help. Um, but yeah, we're if it, on our website, nat, nat site call group, um, uh, the org, you can contact us to join as a member, and that's how and we offer that. It's like basically it's our membership kit, our early membership kit. It's very simple. I think a lot of people, I've, I've mentioned this before, they think it's like this huge packet of stuff. Like, <laughs> it's basically just experience from people oh, like, yeah, like, yeah, like this yeah. who are like, believe me, your first meeting doesn't need to have 100 people. Like, it may have five, and that's great. And when you hold your first event, it may be more than five, it may be 100 people, and you didn't expect that. Like, like it happens to all of us. So yeah, you know, I'm happy to work with any of you on that as well. Yeah, there are the organizational development resources, and there are a lot of those online. Um, you know, just find yourself start reading Harvard Business Review and things <laughs> like that that you never knew about, and looking for templates for charters, organizational charters, things like that. So there are all those types of resources that you'll need, and then there's the content resources. What's happening in science policy? What are the issues? And uh, definitely, I suggest keeping tabs on the front matter in Science Magazine. They really do a great job covering all the different issues. Uh, there are other groups like one of our partner campuses for ELIS, uh, Duke University, their Science and Society group keeps a tracker list of opportunities for you to actually submit comments on things that are happening right now. So on the Federal Register and other um, opportunities and student groups, why not? Why not share your thoughts about whether a particular policy will work or not? It's a good project. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we are about out of time, so I want to thank you all for being here. I really appreciate your insights. I think the audience did as well. And you know, I'm inspired by all the things that the <laughs> students are doing in, in all of these Amen. groups. And you know, you can do it as well. So just go for it. Don't be afraid. I think is the absolutely main message here. You got this. Good way to learn. Now. Yep. Absolutely. So if you want to watch a recording of today's webinar, you can go to the ESEC website, including this webinar and previously recorded webinars, and that's science-engage.org. You can also um, sign up as an individual ESEC member there if you want, so check that out as an opportunity. There's also um, an online uh, community, community called Trellis that ESEC has a group within, and you can join our Trellis um, community as well. So all that information is on the ESEC website science-engage.org, and thank you for joining us for this webinar. Thanks to the panelists. Thanks. Thanks. Good luck. <laughs>